Book four. So Calerho spent that night weeping and wailing, mourning for Charius while he was still alive. But for a short time she slept, and she dreamed she saw a band of barbarian robbers bringing torches and the ship ablaze and herself rescuing Charius. Dionysius was distressed to see his wife wasting away because, of course, he was afraid her beauty might suffer, and he began to think that it would serve his own love if she abandoned all thought of her former husband for good. So, to show his affection and magnanimity, he said to Calerho, Get up, my dear, and erect a tomb for the poor fellow. Why yearn for what cannot be, and neglect what has to be done? Imagine that he is standing over you, saying, Bury me so that I may pass through the gates of Hades as soon as possible. For even if the poor man's body cannot be found, it is an old Greek custom to offer the honor of a tomb even those who are lost. He soon persuaded her, and since his suggestion was to her liking, as the idea sank in, her grief abated, and she got up from her bed, and began to look for a place to erect the tomb. She was attracted by the area near Aphrodite's temple. That way, posterity too would be reminded of their love. But Dionysius did not want Charius to be so close to the temple, and he wanted to keep that spot for himself. At the same time, he wanted to keep her thoughts occupied, so he said, Let us go to the city, my dear, and erect in front of it a lofty tomb, clearly visible so that it may be seen by men far off from the sea. Miletus had fine harbors, and even Syracusans often anchor in them, so your credit will even reach the ears of your countrymen. Calerho liked the idea and restrained her eagerness for the moment, but once she was in town, she began to construct a tomb on an elevation by the shore. It was like her own tomb in Syracuse in all respects, shape, size, costliness, and like hers, it was built for someone who was still alive. Thanks to the money lavished on it and the abundance of labor, the work was soon completed, and she also staged a mock funeral for Charius. A date was decided and announced, and on that day, the population not only of Miletus, but of practically all Ionia came together. There were also present two satraps who were visiting Miletus at the time, Mithridates of, Kera, of Kareia and Pharnaces of Lydia. They were, were there ostensibly to show respect to Dionysius, but in fact to see Calerho. Her reputation was indeed great throughout all Asia, and by now her name had reached the king of Persia and was more celebrated than that of Ariadne or Lida. On that day, she looked even lovelier than she was reputed to be. She appeared dressed in black with her hair let down, and with her shining countenance and her arms bared, she looked more beautiful than Homer's goddesses of the white arms and fair ankles. In fact, no one present could stand the radiance of her beauty. Some turned their eyes away as if the sun's rays had fallen on them. Some even fell to the ground in worship. Even children were affected. Mithridates, the governor of Caria, was speechless with astonishment. He fell to the ground like someone struck unexpectedly by a slingshot, and his attendants could scarcely hold him up. At the head of the procession was an image of Charius, modeled from the seal of Calerho's ring, but handsome as it was, no one looked at it, because Calerho was there. She alone drew all eyes to her. How could the end of the procession be fitly described? When they reached the tomb, those who were carrying the bier set it down. Calerho went up into it and embraced Charius, kissing his image. First you buried me in Syracuse, and now I am burying you in Miletus. Our misfortunes are not merely great, they are also hard to believe. We have buried each other. You neither of us has yet the other's dead body. Malicious fortune, you do not let us even share a tomb in death. You have exiled even our dead bodies. The crowd broke out in lamentation. Everyone pitied Charius, not for dying, but for being deprived of such a wife.